Hallelujah. There we go. <laughs> Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Uh, Revelation, yeah? Revelation chapter 3. So we, we, we just read it and then... We read the letter to the church in San Francisco. Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you bless the word as we read it. Father, we, uh, even as the scripture says, the entrance of your word gives light, gives understanding to the simple. Father, let your word shine the glorious light into our hearts. And pierce through our hearts and shine your glory in our hearts and give us understanding. Even in the Second Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 4, 6, and 7 says, uh, For God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shone into our hearts uh, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God revealed in the face of Christ Jesus. And we have this treasure in the jars, in jars of clay. So we ask you, Lord, that this light indeed will shine in our hearts and give us the knowledge of the glory of God and take us from one deep level of glory to another even as we behold uh, the glory of the Lord is in a mirror uh, uh, through your word, may we also be transformed tonight, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Harasho, uh, Revelation chapter 3. You have New King James, yeah? Mm. Only from verse 1 to verse 6. You start. Verse 1 to verse 6. Mm -hmm. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things says he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember therefore, how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief, and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not sold their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. He, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Amen. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, okay, we, we first watch what the prophet says, and then we, we discuss. Not sure. So he's talking about the state of the church. And very slowly, even as I started going to those churches to visit and see what was happening in there, in the morning glory, the lunch hour services, in uh, the evening glory, one thing became very apparent, that these places had actually been spurred up. They had been instigated they had been set up with one and one objective to gather money. So they became actually business enterprises <coughs> for wealth accumulation by the pastors. So that which I saw as appearing like revival was essentially not revival. And I think that is really what shocked me. And now you have asked it at such a time when I've just released a message on the state of the temple of the Lord. Reverend, there is no better time at which you would have asked such an important question to me other than now. I can see the leading of the Holy Spirit even in having you ask this question. Because I've just released a print which has gone out in the Christian newspaper and also to some of the radios and also some recordings for video production and TV programming 
on the house of the Lord. Now I'm going to walk you very carefully into the state of the mind of God regarding the church and at the end of which you're going to be completely validated and updated on the true state of the church and even it will bring up a challenge into your soul, into your spirit as to how much work there is for the church to accomplish that which the Lord set out for her. I want to begin specifically with the mighty conversation of the Lord, the conversation the Lord had with me on the 20th of November, the year 2007, when the Lord, he spoke with me about the state of the church. And in that tremendous vision of the Lord, I went to sleep at night, and then I saw the vision of the Lord. In that vision, all of a sudden, I was walking on a road. And as I walked on that road, I very quickly realized that the presence of the Lord was walking with me. And I was aware, I was made aware that he was on my right hand side, though I could not see him. And as we walked down this road, the voice of the Lord began to speak, coming from my right hand side. And the voice of the Lord was helping me even as I walked on this road, and he was showing me the rocks, the pebbles, and the things that I would have stumbled on and caused me to tumble over, to fall. So he was telling me to avoid them. And I continued doing this, Reverend Amos, up to a point and it was so amazing how comfortable it is to walk within the presence of the Lord. But as we walked on, we reached a point where there was a junction. And one part of the road split and turned left, while the other one went right. And then the voice of the Lord asked me to take the one that turned right. And as we went right, I realized that this one now that I took, that was going right, was slightly safer than the one we left which was going left. The Lord made me aware that the one going left, there, some people, I still see them even now, I see that vision even now. I see some people lying across the road on the one that was going left. They had been devoured. They had been attacked. And that creature, I think, looked like a beast. It looked like a wild dog or something like that. But the one we took that veered right, it was safe. Though there were these stones that he still told me to avoid as we walked on. But the only thing that was bothering to me was the fact that it was a little bit more winding than the road that went left. And it was winding with turns such that I could not see what lay ahead as we walked. That's the only concern I seem to have gathered. But the voice of the Lord created a sense of comfort even as I continued, I walked on, but I had a deep sense of comfort because he essentially was leading me and he flooded me with a sense of comfort and protection, even though I could not see what lay ahead. Up to a point then, when that road now, it veered right and more right and right, and then the voice of the Lord said, look and see the house of the Lord. So Reverend Amos, when I lifted my head, in that vision of the Lord, I saw the house of the Lord. And 
what I saw was this golden dome, the mighty golden dome that was on top of the house of the Lord. And on the golden dome, the, 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 the contact between the golden dome and the roof of the house of the Lord had been ravaged. It, we, the only three scaffold remnant metals were now left as supporting the golden dome above the roof of the house of the Lord. And as I looked, I could see a state of abandonment from a distance still as the Lord asked me to look and see. A state of abandonment that had befallen the house of the Lord. And these three vertical metals, pieces of metal, they were scaffold and remnant. They held the dome in position while the roof of the house then maintained that support that supported uh, the golden dome. What was amazing to me, even to another level, was the fact that uh, then the voice of the Lord spoke and he said, let us enter into the house of the Lord. At that point, immediately, I was able now to see a double-arched door that was ahead of me that led into the temple of the Lord. But before then, I realized that heaven opened and I saw a massive cloud of the glory of the Lord that came down from heaven Hallelujah. And came and settled on the dome. Settled on the dome that was now sitting on the roof of the house of the Lord. Well, we entered. I entered even as the Lord, the glory of the Lord also entered into the house of the Lord. But at the point at which I entered, then I realized the voice of the Lord was now coming from the altar area. And then the Lord, he said, look, this is the house of the Lord. And for me to see, I had to turn my head left. So again, until now, I don't know whether I was in the spirit or I was in both the spirit and the body. So I turned left and saw millions and millions of chairs in the house of the Lord. And the chairs I saw, they were very black chairs and they had some arm rests where you would rest your arm. But then after that, I realized very quickly that the millions of chairs I was looking at in the house of the Lord were virtually empty. There was nobody, literally nobody sitting in the house of the Lord. And in the process of looking at them, then some grass begin to grow between the chairs. Hallelujah. And even as that happened, I, I was very stunned. I was very astonished at the grass that was now growing in the house of the Lord. It grew up to a point where I could not, they covered the seats, I could not now not see the seats. And then finally, the voice of the Lord, again coming from the altar area, he said, they used to worship here, but not anymore. And then he said, God tell these people to repent and prepare for the coming of the Lord. Then at that point I woke up, and that was the 20th of November, the year 2007. So, beginning that time on, I began to pray and even preach this message. I began to talk about the great desolation that had eaten into the house of the Lord. And I know very well, Reverend Amos, from the scripture, the Bible comes out very, very clearly on this matter of desolation in the house. Even the fingerprints of desolation. Amen. 
Here. So that's uh, that's our point of discussion today. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yes, a bit heavy. Huh? A bit heavy. Yes, heavy. This thing can go off. Do you think it off? Huh? It does. Because uh, I don't think it's. Good. Good. So, what I want us to do is uh, now when we look at the the church in Sardis, okay, mm -hmm. it's doing some good though. <laughs> Even though it's not excellent, it's doing some good. Mm -hmm. Okay, we see in the church. Um, of Sardis that uh -huh. that the church is dead. Amen? Mm -hmm. So I want us to, to just discuss on this. So as, as, as the prophet has said, so the Lord showed him the house of the Lord. Of course that was uh, some time ago as he mentioned in the video. And uh, the time he was sharing that vision was in 2008 and so he's sharing the vision of the house of the Lord that uh, when the Lord took him unto the house of the Lord <coughs> the house of the Lord was in a desolate state uh, that the house of the Lord the Lord says Look, they used to worship here. And, but now, they are no more. The chairs are dark. The grass is growing. The house has been abandoned. So I listened to that uh, vision, or I think I, I ponder on that vision. And then I look at Sardis and I say, no wonder. And I say, the house of the Lord here in Sardis is a dead church. So it's not surprising, or should we say uh, it's alarming that the house of the Lord is dead. Uh, and we've been trying to answer the question of why is this house, why is this church, you know, what, what, why does the Lord come and say it's a dead church? What is it that happened? How come this church is dead? And we, we of course, we understood that it has to do with the, with the Holy Spirit that was no longer in this house, in this church. Even though there were a few people, but you can see that it's a dead church that means the Holy Spirit is not any longer. In fact, even as uh, the, the, the mighty prophet was uh, sharing, it says the Lord, actually, that the vision started in the middle. I mean, uh, uh, the story started in the middle or towards the end. That the Lord used to show him in the visions, the Lord used to show him these churches where people would meet for lunch hour service, morning glory, evening glory. And he thought, Oh, <coughs> this, is, uh, this is revival. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are having prayer meetings in the morning, prayer meetings during lunchtime at, at work prayer meetings in the evening. This surely must be revival. Until when he began to visit these places and then he, he realized that actually these places or these meeting meetings were not uh, a phase of revival had nothing to do with the revival. They were actually, as he said, set up as places for the pastor or as opportunities for the pastors to make more money. Because when people go there for those lunch hour services, I guess they would. You know, the pastor will ask them to sow a seed to reap a miracle. And that's the desolate state. And we look at the church in Sardis here and see how 
he calls it a dead church. Uh, yeah, what's what's your say on that? What's what's your say on this on this dead house? Because of course the mighty prophet at one point said it was it was surprising for him that the Lord will show him such a dream. Because and he even asked Lord, do you mean there is no one? You don't see anyone in the house at all. And of course, that's a time when there are TV preachers, even then there were TV preachers on the TV. I mean, preachers on TV, televangelists, many, many, many crusades being held. Yet the Lord shows his prophet that in the house he doesn't see anyone. But we see the love of the Lord nevertheless. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and one thing I see here, one thing I see even as we read this, this, uh, these letters to the churches, uh, I see that, number one, he's dealing with each church separately. Hmm. When he's dealing with these churches, he's looking at Sardis, and he's not looking at Sardis in light of Ephesus or at Sardis and then trying to compare Sardis with the church in Thyatira. He, he doesn't do that anyway. Have you realized that? He, whenever he's addressing each one of these churches, he does not use another church as a benchmark. Or to say, or at least you are better than <laughs> this one. Even as he tells them to repent that they may enter heaven, uh, he, does not, he does not say, look, you must try to be better than the Ephesians. Or you must try to be better than the Pergamon, the church in Pergamon. I think that was very profound. And it really tells you a lot about how the Lord is going to it judges each and every one of us. Uh, so you, you see really the, 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 the integrity of the Lord in His judgment and how much it speaks of that day of judgment as well. That uh, on that day indeed, because even here as He looks at the church in Sardis, He says, I know your deeds. Amen. Uh, he, he, he looks at Sardis, He takes Sardis and He says, now let us look at you, let us examine you as Sardis. It says, I know you, you have some works, and you appear to be alive. Eh? It says, I know your deeds, you have a reputation of being alive. You appear to be alive. You have put on some makeup for people to think you are alive. Eh? You put on some makeup to have a certain appearance which is not real. To make you appear alive, but you are really dead. And we understand that's because the Holy Spirit is left, has left the church of Sardis. That's profound. Based squarely on what they have done. And the benchmark is the Lord Himself with respect to. His holiness. I think that that's that's very powerful, uh, because uh, you know that uh, whenever you you, you 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 preach holiness, you tell people to repent from their sins. They say some of them like to, to defend their sins. You know, I'm not perfect. Nobody is perfect. Nobody is perfect. <laughs> I'm not perfect. And then and then they begin to say, uh, what's, the, what's that? Uh, yeah, they, they, they say they are not perfect. God yeah? is loving. God is loving. Da da da. And then they say, uh, wait, 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 where is that word going now? <laughs> da. But but then you see that they take comfort in the weakness of the human flesh. Mm, we all make mistakes. And it is the weakness of the flesh that the Lord is rebuking here. <laughs> da. And then, oh yeah, of course, some of them will never say. At least I'm I'm not like some people. Yes, sir. You know, we say you know. I'm not like so and so, or I'm not like, you know. 
I do that. And well, that. yes, at least I do this, at least I do that. Yet, when the Lord takes you, and then he begins to probe you, squarely based on his holiness and what you have done. <laughs> He's able to say such things. That there is death in the camp. That there is death in the camp. Amen. So he says, but you are dead. We have talked about this death. He says, wake up. But last time we were talking about the Holy Spirit. Yeah? I think I even forgot where we left off. We are talking about the Holy Spirit and how that he left. And we are looking at one of the things that makes Holy Spirit to leave. Mm. No? And we, we examined that... Uh, Really, at the bottom line of it all, at the bottom line of the Holy Spirit leaving, is sin. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Really? That's, that's the main one. <laughs> that, 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 we, we, we cannot really try to make it super complicated. Simply sin. Because we know that the Lord does not dwell with sin. He has no place with sin. He has no accommodation for sin. He has no tolerance for sin. He has no agreement with sin. And that's what he says. <laughs> yes. He that's has no covenant with sin. Mm. He has no friendship with sin. He has no camaraderie with sin. Eh? Like comrades. <laughs> we are comrades. Mm. Yeah? So he has no common ground with sin. And he is no equal with, he has no place for sin. And that's why you find the Apostle Paul saying, Neither give place to the devil. says, don't give him a chance. says, do not let your instrument, do not let the members of your bodies be instruments of sin. Because it is sin that ultimately hurts the Holy Spirit. Because when we talk about grieving the Holy Spirit, for instance, he says, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God whom you have given. It, that's sin. That means there are certain sins, for so to say, there are certain sins that grieve him. Or all sins. All sins grieve him, yes. Very true. All sins grieve him. And, and even though the apostle, was it John or James who said, uh, there is a sin that does not lead to, to, what? Death. to death. He says, he says, pray for one who has committed a sin that does not lead to death. And he says, I do not say, pray for the one who, who, sinned, who sinned a sin that leads to death. So, so even though there is a sin that leads to death and sin that does not lead to death, nevertheless, all sin is offensive to the Holy Spirit. Now, and there are those particular ones that, especially, for instance, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, where you receive no forgiveness at all. Where he refuses to say, I will not forgive you, not now, not tomorrow, not ever, not when you, no, not, not when you die, never. And that's a huge sentence. When the Holy Spirit refused to, or I mean when, when one sins and really short circuits himself from entering heaven. That means this is a kind of sin that short circuits, short circuits, yeah, that it's a, it's a death sentence. It's like when you commit this kind of sin, you are signing your death sentence. It's like you are forfeiting your place in heaven. Like ultimately, like to say, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you are signing an everlasting document that says, I will never go to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> now you find in the book of Isaiah is it 60 or 61 in the, the book of Isaiah it says uh, in the book of Isaiah it says because the, 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 because there is a <laughs> there was a conflict yeah there was a conflict 
And as a result, Israel found itself in trouble. What do you want to do? I want to do it. What? For the mouse. Oh. <laughs> the, the, book of <laughs> the book of Isaiah. Uh, I love I love Isaiah 51 verse 1. He says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness and who seek the Lord. Look, the rock from which you are cut and the quarry from which you are hewn. Ah, I love that. I love that. So Isaiah 59, I believe. Isaiah says, The whole of pit from which you are cut. Ah, but he says, Speaking to those who seek after righteousness. Mm. Ah, that's powerful. Remember where the Lord took you from. Mm. It says, Remember. So Isaiah fifty nine, verse one and two and three, and I really love the book of Isaiah even from the <laughs> from the very beginning because Isaiah is like Isaiah is like a, a herald. Whenever I think of Isaiah, I think of a herald because. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry for jumping these chapters. When, when, you, when you go to Isaiah chapter 1, right at the beginning, because his story comes later in chapter 6 where he was being called, yeah? But right from the beginning, Isaiah begins to rebuke sin. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, this guy. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I read children and brought them up. But they were, re re but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation, a people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. Ah, oh, the guy is rebuking. From day one, I mean, from the, from the word go. <laughs> it's like a herald. It just hits the ground running. Well, that's very powerful. Yeah, the, the, I, I, I love Isaiah. Yes, that's what I was saying. <laughs> the herald. I call him the herald. <laughs> Isaiah the herald. Now, when, when uh, Isaiah 59, mm -hmm. From this one, mm -hmm. it's really it's, it's like he's really documenting the, the, the sins of the people here, uh, and then later on he talks about I think it's here where he talks about put on righteousness, the best press plate. Yeah, okay, okay, let's read this one. So let, let's read first verse one and two, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and then then after that he begins to, to, to name the sins he's rebuking. Right. Says, so Surely. The arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor his ear too dull to hear. Would you like to read the next one? But your iniquities have your separated iniquities. you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. That's powerful. It says, your hands are stained with blood. That's why, it says, that's why, The Lord eh, has turned away. He says, your iniquities... Ah, I was reading verse 3, sorry. Yeah, verse 2. <laughs> verse 3, your, your hands are stained with blood. Verse 2, but your iniquities separated. Mm -hmm. He's saying, Israel was in such a state where salvation was far from them. Because he says, behold, surely, look, the arm of the Lord is not too short to save. Or well, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. Now that means they were in a state needing salvation or needing spasene, needing deliverance. Da? And the Lord is saying, look, you need salvation right now, but it's not because my hands are too short. <laughs> Or that they, they are short at all. The, hand, the Lord's hands is not shortened. 
They are in a state where they cried, they wailed, they shouted, they lifted their voice, and they were in such limbo, they needed someone to hear. They cried, and it looks like no one was hearing. And the Lord said, look, it's not because my, he my ears are down that I did not answer you. <laughs> he says, my ears work properly, and my hand is long enough to save, to save because when you look through the book of Isaiah, of, 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 uh, of, 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 of Psalm, it says, it says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever. So he saved them from Egypt, from their enemies, from captivity, from really many, many places before the times of Isaiah, during the days of the King David and many others. He says, he has stretched out his arm from heaven and he saved them from their enemies to a point where sometimes they didn't even need to fight. But at this point in time, there was no salvation. And the reason is because there was a separation between Israel and the Lord. And that separation was nothing other than sin. I mean, sin had put up a separation between them and God in such a way that sin became a wall between them and God. Such that even when they were praying, they felt like their prayers were hitting the ceilings. <laughs> and bouncing back. And bouncing back. Because this sin, it says, your iniquities have separated you from your God. They have made a separation. They have hidden his face. Meaning, when they were trying to look for him, he was not found of them, not because he was not uh, he was he, uh, not because he is not the one who can be found, but because they were not turning away from their sins. They wanted the Lord to save them, but they were not repenting from their sins. And so they were still in a sinful state, not seeking repentance, but wanting to be saved and still continue sinning. They were sinning, or perhaps they were sinning, but you see, they were crying. They were sinning, huh, worshipping idols, as the prophet said, hammering the foot of an idol to its, to its feet. <laughs> a wooden leather, well, no, no, a wooden, wooden, <laughs> they take a wooden idol, and then they take leather, and hammer it on the feet, mm -hmm. and they say, this is my God for reproduction. And then at the same time, they are saying, Lord, send us rain. <laughs> yeah. And then, in such idolatry and adultery, they wanted to have two. The Lord on this side, and then Baal on this side. <laughs> So that if the Lord does not answer, then Baal will answer. <laughs> if Baal does not answer, yeah. then the Lord answers. <laughs> it says, I corner, <laughs> not here. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, that sin, and he names now, he names a lot of sin really here. He says, one of the sins there, he says, the shedding of blood, mm -hmm. the fingers were guilty. Their lips have spoken lies. Mm -hmm. eh? There was no justice, even in their courts. They rely on empty arguments. Their lawyers were filthy liars. Mm -hmm. eh? It says, they hatch the eggs of vipers and spin a spider's web. My goodness. Whoever eats their eggs will die. My, 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 my. <laughs> they were a snare. And, and, and so many evils here. They, they pursue evil schemes. They do not know the way of peace. Righteousness was thrown away. 
justice was far away, and and so in such states they have missed the presence of the Lord. Meaning, the presence of the Lord walked away from them. The presence, the glory of the Lord left because they were indulging in adultery, in spiritual adultery. Now we said, this house in uh, Sardis is dead. Amen? Amen. Yeah, well, you see, when we said, they were deceived. We said that, yeah? He said, how come you are worshipping? Then he leaves. Because they were involved in some deeds. And in the process of their deeding, <laughs> in the process of their doing their deeds, the Holy Spirit left. And when the Holy Spirit left, their worship was worthless. But as they were worshipping, worshipping, they didn't realize that the Holy Spirit had left until there was breaking news. Dead church. The Lord had to send a messenger to tell them, breaking news, dead church. That means your worship amounts to nothing. So let me say, how come they continued in that desolate state, barely holding on to the glory? Because he says, watch out, for there are still a few fragments. Strengthen that which remains before it dies. So much of it has died. He says, how come they continued in such death spell and they didn't know that the Holy Spirit left? Oh, really? How can you cut off your ear <laughs> and you think it's a good thing unless you are deceived? Yeah? Because you find those people that, that try to tattoo themselves and they are just cutting into their flesh. Or some people, they just like to cut into their flesh. People want to commit suicide. That's deception. That is the true definition of deception. deception. Apparently it's recording. Hallelujah. That's the true definition of deception. So now, we say they were deceived. <laughs> so, they were deceived. That means they were embracing a different doctrine. And that means there was also apostasy in this house. If there is one thing that strings through, that underpins the message to the churches, underpins, yeah? The, the, like a common thread. Mm -hmm. That underpins this instruction to church one, church two, church three, church four, four, four from Ephesus all the way to, to, that, to, what, to Sardis, is, is this one. Like the faithful church. Is this one? Is this one? Apostasy. There is death. The prophet told us apostasy equals to death. Turning away from true doctrine. There's apostasy in this house. Now, that, that's very impressive. Now, these churches were in different regions. So, Ephesus, apostasy. The next one, apostasy. Thyatira, apostasy. Phrygia, apostasy. Did we reach Phrygia yet? No, I don't think. I, I didn't reach Phrygia. Uh -huh. Pamphylia. Did we reach Pamphylia? Uh -huh. <laughs> Smyrna, yes. apostasy. Ephesus, apostasy. Pergamon, apostasy. Thyatira, apostasy. Sardis, dead, deceived, apostasy. Then that means, wait, if there is apostasy, there is, there is, there is, there is wrong doctrine. Now this brings us back to the triad. Remember the triad from Smyrna? Yes. It says, Jezebel comes in with the wrong doctrine. Mm -hmm. Apostasy. Then 
the apostles, then leads to, idol to, what? to idolatry, which leads to adultery or immorality. In fact, idolatry is the true definition of immorality. The immorality is embedded in, finds its footing in, is rooted in, in what? In idolatry. If you do not worship the one true God, or if you claim to worship God but really you don't, for everyone that is involved in immorality, their hearts are not on the Lord. Idolatry, no, who is it? Immorality, sexual immorality, adultery, finds its root in spiritual immorality. That's why you find in the book of 1 Corinthians 6 when he talks about, shall I then take the body of Christ and unite it with the body of a prostitute? Look, he's saying, when you engage in in what? In wrong doctrine. When you engage in idolatry, that is the true definition of adultery, of immorality. Because there is only one true husband, the Lord. <laughs> he says, the Lord is the creator and he is the only one we should worship. So when we turn away from the Lord, and begin to worship other things. Look, the Lord is the only source. So when we turn away from the Lord, and then we begin to worship the moon, and then they begin to worship the sun and the stars, that is idolatry. That is adultery. They are idolatrizing them. They are giving themselves over to be defiled by demons. James 4 4. James 4 4. I, idolatry is adultery. It's immorality. Then every form of immorality really finds its footing in there. It finds its footing in there. Whether it's those that are deceived, they say, no, I'm just postmodern. I'm, I'm, I'm a what? We, we are living in the age of postmodernism. Mm -hmm. Me, I don't worship any, I, any god. Me, 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 <laughs> me, I just believe in science. Idolatry. Immorality.